Turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. Appreciate you coming this morning. Lord bless you. We're going to celebrate our nation's independence this week. And I want to say to um, all the folk that are listening to us from Kenya. I don't know exactly what date it was. And I don't remember the year. I looked this up at one time and looked a little bit into Kenya's history. But at, some, at one point, God made Kenya a free and independent nation. They were given their freedom and they were given their independence. And I think God was in that. Because at one time, Kenya used to be under the rule of Great Britain. Great Britain is sort of following America, or America's following Great Britain. I don't know who's following who. In that, the liberties and the freedoms that have been available in both countries now, people have used as a license to commit the most heinous atrocities and sins that God lists in His Word. These things are an abomination unto the Lord. And so God set Kenya free from being forced to follow the rules of Great Britain. President Obama went to Kenya a few years ago almost demanding that Kenya rewrite its constitution to allow for sodomite weddings. The president of Kenya followed President Obama's speech and said, go back to America. We have bigger problems to deal with in Kenya. We have poverty, we have sickness, we have tribal warfare, and it is against the law in the nation of Kenya to even commit the act of sodomy. Mr. President, take it back to America. We don't want it. And I tell you what, God will bless Kenya for that. Because it is still against the law. I mean, I was with Michael the first time I ever went to Kenya. And I watched two men in Kibera walking down the road and they were holding hands. And I, I went, Michael, what is that? He said, they're friends. We don't have a problem in Kenya of men showing love, natural love for another man and friendship and fellowship. He said, it's not what you think it is. He said, that's against the law. What they're doing is right. I mean, the Apostle Paul said, greet one another with a holy kiss. We don't do that in America, but that is common among other nations. Greet one with a kiss, not on the lips, on the cheek. And it's a holy kiss. It's a sign of mutual affection and fellowship and friendship. I went, okay, I got you. That's what I thought. Just wanted to make sure. But it's illegal in Kenya to even commit the act of sodomy. While I was researching yesterday, I was going through some of the things, some of the statements made by some of our founders. I was look, reading about George Washington. While he was the general of the armed forces of the United States of America during the Revolutionary War, one of his officers was accused of attempted sodomy on another soldier. He attempted it on one of his own men. The man, the officer, was brought to trial, found guilty, and was released with, from the army with infamy, which is basically a dishonorable discharge. And he was literally, Wayne, they had a ceremony where they drum you out. If you've ever heard that expression, you'll get drummed out. They used to literally put somebody out in ceremonial fashion as men played drums. They had that, whoever was guilty, forced out of the military for the crime which they committed. But now we live in a country where they have turned the liberties that were fought, bled, and died for into a license to sin. And I submit to you that our founders never intended for it to be that way. Amen. Galatians chapter 5. 
Read your Bibles. Verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. I'm going to give you a little bit of history this morning and a little bit of scripture this morning. We're going to go over the Declaration of Independence, how it was framed, what was in the mind of the men who decided to stand against King George III in Great Britain, risking their lives, their fortunes, their posterity, putting it all on the line for the sake of being a free people. And I submit to you this morning that liberty and freedom is a gift of God alone. If God gives it to a people, it is a gift. Maybe they don't deserve it. Maybe God sees that they'll do something good with it. At one time, that liberty that was given to us in this country was a liberty to follow Jesus Christ alone. Now, I'm not going to ask you to say amen, but every now and then, I think you ought to. All right. Let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, that you bless this church service. Father, we need to pray for our country. This morning, in St. Louis and around the world, the Sodomites are flaunting their sin in your face. You said in your word, they declare their sin is Sodom, they hide it not. And Father, we understand that the heinousness, the wickedness that is on display this morning is the result of a nation forgetting who their God is. And Father, my prayer for my children and my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren is that they would have the blessing of living in a nation that honored Jesus Christ and not be raised in a nation that flaunts its sin the way is what's going on this morning. Father, I ask for your help preaching this message. I pray, dear God, that you would open up our hearts and give us understanding, Father, of how far we've gone away from the Declaration of Independence. Father, bless this service. Bless the message, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, I had planned this morning, I've done this before, of reading the Declaration of Independence. Just for time's sake, I'm going to forego that, but I am going to read the last portion of it and what it was, if you're not aware of what July 4th represents, then I'm going to share some things with you this morning. We were intended to be a nation that was free from the bondage of King George in Great Britain and free from the bondage of being forced into a religion by way of the Church of England and the Church of Rome being forced into a religion whose ideas and practices were against Scripture and were against the beliefs of the people who followed the Word of God. We do not want a state-regulated religion in any way, shape, or form. We do not want the government to tell us in our churches what we can and cannot speak for or against. So here's what they wrote. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. If you remember, the King of England hired Hessian soldiers as armed thugs against the people in the colonies. As of that point, he abdicated his right 
to rule over those people. So they said, a prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Nor have we been wanting in attentions to our British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislature to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our immigration and settlement here. We have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity and have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations which would inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondence. We don't talk like that anymore. They too have been deaf to the voice of justice and of consanguinity. consanguinity. You pronounce it. We must therefore acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war, in peace, friends. We therefore, the representatives of the United States of America and General Congress assembled, appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do in the name and by authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent States. You know what that means? That if the people of the state of Missouri don't like what Washington, D.C. goes by, we don't have to follow it. I still believe in... Who said, who said that's correct? I still believe in states' rights. And under Obama, if he wanted to push new gun laws, I say we don't follow them. Because if they push that, they're going to push laws that will prohibit us from preaching against sin. And I'm here to tell you this world and this nation is full of iniquity. And it's on display this very morning. In St. Louis right now, hundreds of of thousands of people have gathered to flaunt the act of sodomy in the face, number one, of the people of the state of Missouri, number two, the face of God himself. If we think that God is okay with that and that he will not punish this nation for that sin, we are in error. We're in grave error. So he said that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states and that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. And that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Many of the men who signed the Declaration of Independence, several of them lost their life, many of them lost their farms, their businesses, they lost it all. Civilians, innocent civilians were slaughtered by the British army and the Hessian soldiers. Murdered in the streets. And our forefathers said, we've had enough. We ought to serve God and not man. I saw this yesterday. It's not just in St. Louis. This is Mexico City. Tens of thousands join gay pride parades around the world. This is happening everywhere. And what you have is, you have not just the sodomites supporting this and attending it. You have hundreds of thousands of heterosexuals who stand in favor of this sin. And it is a sin. 
Turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Can I preach today? For everything that the devil took out of me last Sunday, God's put it back double today. Romans chapter 1, verse 24. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness, through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. There are people in the streets right now whose t-shirts say, Satan loves me. Going to hell and proud of it. Blank Jesus. I'm not kidding you. They are the admitted enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ. Whereby God reached down from heaven to save them from their sins. They despise God's love and mercy and flaunt their sin as Sodom in God's face. Verse 26, for this cause God gave them up to unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burning their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their heir which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. That's, and all you gotta do is look to see what t-shirt they're wearing. And there are, right now, Christian churches that are at that parade in support of them. They're not Christians. They're not the church. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without natural understand, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, but not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Now turn to 1 Kings chapter 14. 1 Kings chapter 14. That's what I have up on the screen. Here's what we're saying. Listen, this Bible is this Bible's right. And this Bible, what you, you... Let me just encourage you with something. Read your Bible. Because you know what you're doing? You're reading the newspaper. You're reading what's happening in our country and in our world right now. The thing that hath been, Solomon said, is the thing that shall be. And there is no new thing under the sun. So in 1 Kings 14, verse 22, And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins, which they had committed above all that their fathers had done. When have we ever seen a time in this country where sodomites could parade around as sodomites and everybody, whoo, oh, they're so brave, they're so... Let me tell you about brave. Brave is those guys who jumped out of those ships on D-Day, on the Omaha Beach, knowing they would be slaughtered. Those are brave. Brave is the man who went to the cross willingly to fight our enemies. That was brave. That's not bravery, that's sick. For they also built them high places and images and groves on every high hill and under every green tree. They're worshiping all these other gods. There were also sodomites in the land, and they did according to all that the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. Read your Bible. Do we not understand that God brought people to a land flowing with milk and honey to serve God in freedom and in liberty? Do we not understand that that's how we got here? They rewrite history and tell you there's all other kind of reasons. No, it was so that people could worship God in freedom without the King of England or the Pope of Rome tell them how to do it. God brought them out of bondage, brought them to a land, gave them liberty. But in that, and God cast out. 
You should have read some of the things I read yesterday. You know what Cortez found? You know what Columbus found when he came and discovered these Indian tribes that were living in the land? That many of them committed the act of sodomy openly and had no knowledge whatsoever that it was wrong. When Cortez came to the shores of Mexico and came to the, to the halls of Montezuma, saw the temple that was erected there in Mexico City, saw human blood and human remains splattered all over the place because they believed in killing innocent children and women in their temple. Is everything all right? All right. Father, watch over us. Bless us in this church. Keep us safe, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said. God cast His people out of that land. Did He not? The question is, will God cast us out of here? Who knows what could happen? Proverbs 14, 34, Righteousness exalteth the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. There used to be a time when people prayed. Families prayed. There used to be a time before television that people read their Bible. Instead of filling their minds with the sewage that's on TV. Can I get an amen out of somebody? Now... I'm going to just give you some of the ideas behind the men who signed and formed the Declaration of Independence. I read so much yesterday and I had, it, I had a bunch down, had way too much. I thought, man, i got to whittle this down. Charles Carroll wrote on November 4th, 1800 to James McHenry. James McHenry was a signer of the Constitution for whom Fort McHenry was named. Listen to what he said. Without morals, a republic cannot subsist on any length of time. Without morals, we cannot have a republic. You know what a republic is? This country is not a democracy. It is a republic. It means that we have the, the liberty to vote for representatives who represent us. And you're wondering why our politicians are selling out? It's not because of the politicians. It's because the people are evil. Look at what was said. Without morals, a republic, it, a republic cannot subsist any length of time. They, therefore, who are decrying the Christian religion, whose morality is so sublime and pure, which ensures to the good eternal happiness, are undermining the solid foundation of morals, the best security for the duration of free government. This man was right. We cannot last as a free people if we use the liberty to Cry out our sins against God. Cannot happen. Let me show you what was in the Pennsylvania Constitution. Remember, Pennsylvania, founded by William Penn, was a Quaker state. It was founded by Quakers. Here's what they said. Just over two months after the Declaration of Independence was signed, Benjamin Franklin was elected president of Pennsylvania's Constitutional Convention. On September 28, 1776, he signed the state's first constitution. Here's what it said. You could not be elected as a representative in Pennsylvania without swearing this oath. Each member, before he takes his seat, shall make and subscribe the following declaration. I do believe in one God, the creator and governor of the universe, the rewarder of the good and the punisher of the wicked. And I do acknowledge the scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be given by divine inspiration. And no further or other religious test shall ever hereafter be required of any civil officer or magistrate in this state. You had to believe that Jesus was the King of Kings. You had to believe that the Bible was given by divine inspiration of God and was a gift given to man. You had to swear that before you could sit as a representative of the people. We've forgotten God in this nation. This picture of George Washington. I'm here to tell you that painting is true. 
and a true exhibit of the man who led our nation against evil forces. As I'm giving you this, I want you to think now of the enemies of the state. Enemies of the nation of Christian people who are still in this country. Remember, we just sang a song, This World Is Not My Home. Yes, I am a citizen of the United States of America, and I love my country. I'm not so happy with my government. But I love my country. I don't want to live anywhere else. I am also a citizen of Jerusalem above, which is free. And I'm here to tell you, and I've preached this before, even if we lose the liberties that we have here, God's people will always be free people. Let me show you. In fact, there was one, there was an Indian chief. George Washington led a war against, before the Revolutionary War, led a war against, it was called the French and Indian War. I don't know if you remember that. There was one Indian chief who said, he made this statement. I tried myself to kill George Washington. I shot at him over 30 times and every bullet missed that man. God must be protecting him. Here's the account of an 18-year-old soldier under General Washington, a man by the name of Anthony Sherman. Here's what he said. You have doubtless heard the story of Washington going to the thicket to pray. Well, it was not only true, but he used often to pray in secret for aid and comfort from God. The interposition of whose divine providence brought us safely through those dark days of tribulation. You know what his men knew about him? He prayed. He prayed. On May 15, 1776, General Washington issued this order. Listen to, listen to the man who led the army. The Continental Congress, having ordered Friday the 17th instant to be observed as a day of fasting and humiliation and prayer, humbly to supplicate the mercy of Almighty God, that it would please Him to pardon all our manifold sins and transgressions. In St. Louis today, the St. Louis City Police Department asked permission to participate for the first time in the sodomite parade sodomite police officers whose allegiances are not the same as what our allegiance is to you think about it here's a man who prayed that all of his soldiers would call upon God to forgive them of them of their sins and to prosper the arms of the United Colonies and finally establish the peace and freedom of America upon a solid and lasting foundation. The general commands all officers and soldiers to pay strict obedience to the orders of the Continental Congress that by their unfeigned and pious observance of their religious duties they may incline the Lord and give her a victory to prosper our arms. By the way, it worked. Great Britain's soldiers outnumbered our soldiers about five to one. And we still beat them. How did that happen? God. July 2nd, 1776, from his headquarters in New York, General Washington issued these general orders. The time is now near at hand at which we must probably determine whether Americans are to be free men or slaves, whether they are to have any property they can call their own, whether their houses and farms are to be pillaged and destroyed and themselves consigned to a state of wretchedness from which no human efforts will deliver them. By the way, the Democratic Party is turning more and more socialist. Bernie Sanders is leading the charge on this. And let me tell you something about socialism. Socialism will steal your house. It'll steal your farm. It'll steal your property and take it and use it to give to people who don't deserve it, who've never worked. That's what socialism does. God gave Israel the right to own property. And we're losing that. How much more do you want? Let me tell you about Samuel Adams, signer of the Declaration. Here's what he said, the right to freedom, the right to freedom being the gift of God Almighty, the rights of the colonists as Christians may best be understood by reading and carefully studying the institutions of the great lawgiver and the head of the Christian church, which are to be found clearly written and promulgated in the New Testament. These men read the Bible and they believed it. Samuel, Samuel Adams quoted scripture, righteousness exalteth the nation. That's what they believed in. 
John Adams, second president of the United States, or, uh, signed the Constitution. Suppose a nation in some distant region should take the Bible for their only law book. And every member should regulate his conduct by the precepts there exhibited. Every member would be obliged in conscience to temperance, frugality, and industry, to justice, kindness, and charity towards his fellow men, and to piety, love, and reverence toward Almighty God. What a utopia and what a paradise would this region be. Turn to Psalm 35. Boy, I wish I had the time and the grace and everything else to read you a lot of this. I, I'm a student of history. I'm a student of American history. By the way, I didn't finish what I was saying to the Kenyan people. Here's what God has done for those people. Yes, Great Britain took over the, the land of Kenya and made it a colony of Great Britain. But let me show you the providence of God in that. When the British moved in, they settled that area. What they brought with them, number one, was tea. And they drink tea in, in Kenya. When we hold meetings over there, they'll stop and they'll say, Brethren, it is time for us to take our tea. They sit down like British people and take tea and eat biscuits. Not American biscuits, you know, little cookies we call them. But they take their tea, so they brought tea. They brought a republican form of government to the Kenyan people and that's basically what they established when Great Britain left. They also gave the gift to the Kenyan people of the English language. We're being listened to right now by people who can understand English and read the greatest book ever given to mankind the King James Bible God loved the Kenyan people and others now I won't talk about Western Africa that was settled by France they're not they're not nice people but where the British settled and left English those people can read the King James Bible now let me, let me read to you this, and I'm going to get to the message. Seriously. October 11, 1798, President John Adams stated in a letter to the officers of the 1st Brigade of the 3rd Division of the Militia of Massachusetts. Listen to what he said. We have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. Religion and Christian religion is necessary among a free people to bridle their lusts. The teaching and preaching that there is a just God who punishes sinners is a necessity among a free people. That's what he said. Avarice, ambition, revenge, Gallantry would break the strongest cords of our Constitution as a whale goes through a net. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. And he was right. Now, on September 7th, 1774, John Adams wrote to his wife Abigail describing the effects of the prayer which opened the first session of the Continental Congress. It could be said that right here was the seeds of the Declaration of Independence. Right here. So you got your Bible open to Psalm 35. Let me read this. John Adams said, when Congress met, Mr. Cushing made a motion that it should be open and with prayer. Accordingly, the next morning, Ms. Reverend Mr. Duche appeared and read the 35th Psalm. Now, we're going to go through that here in a minute, but I'm going to read to you the, the effects of it. John Adams said, I never saw a greater effect upon an audience. It seemed as if heaven had ordained that psalm to be read on that morning. How many of you have ever had that happen where you just open up to the psalms and it just seemed like heaven wanted you to read that, that psalm that day? Let me hear God's people say amen. He said, I never saw a greater effect. After this, Mr. Duche, unexpectedly to everybody, struck out into an extemporary prayer. Do you know what that means? He prayed without reading it. And he said, which filled the bosom of every man present, I must confess, I never heard a better prayer or one so well pronounced. 
And I believe that right here, the seeds of the Declaration of Independence were sown two years before it happened. Now, when you read Psalm 35, you'll find out why. Now, as we go through this, I want you to think about who your enemies are. Number one, our enemies are all the people who've gathered up in St. Louis. That is by their own statements. They despise Bible Christianity and anybody who says that their lifestyle is immoral. And we say it. You see, it's not just... You need to understand something, how God sees it. Sodomy is not the beginning of immorality. Sodomy is the fruit of immorality. You know what built that fruit? Playboy magazine. Hugh Hefner. And all the pornography that began to flood American homes for the last 60, 70 years. Am I joking? The immorality of males and females in this nation has resulted in the sin of sodomy. It's the fruit of the vine of Sodom that has grown in this country. When Jesus taught the parable of the, of the wheat and the tares, I believe it is beginning now to be able to see the difference between who is the wheat and who is the tares. My friends, my brothers and sisters, listen to your preacher. The grace of God must bridle your intemperance. You know what those words mean? May the grace of God choke out your sins instead of your sins choking out the grace of God. One or the other is going to happen. So our enemies are gathered up there in St. Louis. Our enemies are in this town who despise the preaching of the gospel. Our enemies are even in churches having services this morning decrying and despising the preaching of the gospel of grace and anybody who says fornication, adultery, sodomy, that's a sin. Then our enemies are nations around us who hate us and despise us. The question is, will God let them have their way inside of our country? If we keep snubbing our nose at God, He'll have to. Or He'll apologize to Sodom. And then our enemies abide in our own flesh. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Now keep that in mind as we read Psalm 35. You have your Bible open, say amen. Because I don't put it on the screen for it. It's too much. Plead my cause, O Lord, with them that strive with me. Fight against them that fight against me. And let me tell you something. The Sodomites are so vicious in their hatred. They will resort to to killing if they are allowed to do so. I promise you, that day's coming. Take hold of shield and buckler and stand up for mine help. Now think about our, our, the Continental Congress meeting in 1774, hearing this scripture read to them. Draw out also the spear and stop the way against them that persecute me. Say unto my soul, I am thy salvation. Let them be confounded and put to shame that seek after my soul. Let them be turned back and brought to confusion that devise my hurt. Let them be as chaff before the wind and let the angel of the Lord chase them. Let their way be dark and slippery and let the angel of the Lord persecute them. For without cause they have hid for me their net in a pit, which without cause they have digged for my soul. Let destruction come upon him at unawares, and let his net that he hath hid catch himself into that very destruction. Let him fall. And my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in his salvation. 
All my bones shall say, Lord, who is like unto thee, which delivereth the poor from him that is too strong for him? Yea, the poor and the needy from him that spoileth him. False witnesses did rise up. They laid to my charge things that I knew not. That may be for somebody here today. Or somebody listening to me. When you've got people accusing you of things that you have not done. Verse 13. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. You know what that means? I prayed for them. I wanted God to bless them. I humbled my soul with fasting and my prayer returned into mine own bosom. I behave myself as though he had been my friend or brother. I bowed down heavily as one that mourneth for his mother. But in my adversity, they rejoiced and gathered themselves together. Yea, the abjects. You know what that word means? It's related to the word reject. They have been abjected. They have been put out by God. The abjects gathered themselves together against me, and I knew it not. They did tear me and ceased not. With hypocritical mockers and feasts, they gnashed upon me with their teeth. Lord, how long wilt thou look on? Rescue my soul from their destructions, my darling from the lions. I will give thee thanks in the great congregation. I will praise thee among much people. Let not them that are mine enemies wrongfully rejoice over me, Neither let them wink with the eye that hate me without a cause. For they speak not peace, but they devise deceitful matters against them that are quiet in the land. We're not out marching in hate against them. We're in here preaching that God can even forgive them if they will turn to God. Somebody say amen. They object to us because they say that we're haters. Who are the haters? They are. Yea, they opened their mouth wide against me and said, Aha, aha, our eye has seen it. This thou hast seen, O Lord, keep not silence. O Lord, be not far from me. Stir up thyself and wake to my judgment, even unto my cause, my God and my Lord. Judge, listen to this now, this is for you. Judge me, O Lord my God, according to thy righteousness, and let them not rejoice over me. Now I'm going to say this, I'm going to close out, I'm going to finish this out, and I'm going to close this. Before we can cry out against their sin, we must cry out to God over our own. Isn't that what Jesus taught us? Before removing the splinter, we must... Remove the beam. Before we stand in right... See, we, look at that verse again. Judge me, O Lord, my God, according to thy righteousness. Not mine. His righteousness. And the message is we all fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It takes forgiveness, repentance, salvation to those who last for it. Let them be ashamed, verse 26, and brought to confusion together that rejoice at mine hurt. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor that magnify themselves against me. Let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause. Yea, let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified, which hath pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. And my tongue shall speak of thy righteousness and of thy praise all the day long. Amen. Now I want to ask you, I just want you to think about something. I hate saying stuff like this. I don't like, I don't like preaching stuff like this. The sodomite agenda is not going away. The wickedness that exists in this country is like leaven. And it has leavened most of this nation. It has taken over the public institutions. Has it not? Has it not taken over our politicians and our leaders and our judges? Does not even our own police forces participate in their wickedness? Has that leaven not also taken over 
the churches in this country. The churches that still believe the old book are few and far between. Back in the 80s, Jerry Falwell led what he referred to as the moral majority. And he was hated for that. He was despised for that. Here's my question. Could we ever say in America now that there even is a moral majority? I don't believe so. So you have to think about, you have to sober up and you have to think about the issue. What's going to happen? How long is God going to allow this to go on? While Christian people strive to remain Christian people, will we not be afflicted for righteousness sake? Will they not try to consume us and destroy the preaching of the gospel in this country? We know they despise it. We know that we are their target. That's why they're parading today. They're parading against the Bible-believing church. Can I hear God's people say amen? Because really, that's all that's left to stand in opposition to their sin. Is it not? So Ron, we're their target. If at some point we become a real target, Right now, it's only in their minds and in their hearts. At some point, will they not act upon that? Will our guns save us? I don't, I'm not saying give them up. Our guns won't save us. Only the grace of God will do it. Now, I'm not a prophet. I don't know what God has in store for the days that follow today. But I am a student of Scripture. And I know what God has done. Turn one more place and I'm going to let you go. Bear with me. The book of Jude. Verse 4, there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And then he goes on to talk about Sodom and Gomorrah. How they went after strange flesh and God used them as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. But the bottom line is, the idea of this is, God knows how to save His people. Amen. Did God not save Lot? God will save. Amen?